Hello. <laughs> it's just like it says. There we go. Hi, there there you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear us? Okay, thank you. I'm actually, I don't know if we can do it on the the on the big screen and then I and then say good work. But then I'm not sure how I do the slide. I mean we can control it for you if you want. But there's lots of fiddling about. Yeah, I need to fiddling I mean if that's okay, I could um I could just do it like this, but then yeah. my picture's gonna be this one. That's fine. Yeah? Yeah, I mean we have the
Just Emma, can you can you see the slides? Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. Well, let's do that. Yeah. Do you want me to stay here just in case? I think we're all right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're not million miles away. So if uh, <laughs> if anything happens, people can. Okay, just shout. Run them. And then if there's any technical problem this side, I can I can run. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're across, you know, the 3101. 3101. Yeah. 3101. I think it's probably going to be easier from the laptop. You tell me. I think if you set it up on the. Yeah, but then, then it's a question of how do we control the slides? Mm -hmm. We just have to extend the mouse. I don't wait for like three minutes. I don't think it's worth it. I think the technical, te technology risk is, 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 a, <laughs> is sufficiently high. Perfect. Okay. Right. Um, okay. You're not connected to this, so there won't be an echo, I think. I'm not, I'm not connected to the yeah. other thing, so that's just... Um... Okay. Great. Well, let me know if you need anything. Right. Thanks again for doing it. That's my pleasure. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. See you. See you. Thanks.尊敬的各位来宾，本次会议即将开始，请您尽快就座，并将手机等通讯设备关闭或置于静音状态。谢谢您的合作。
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to the launch of World Energy Investment 2023. Since 2021, our Beijing Institute has been working with the IEA, and we have published a few documents and reports and also to explore the energy field in China and in the world. Today, we want to launch the sixth joint report we're working on. And with this World Energy Investment 2023, we'll introduce the current situation of energy in the world. Since 2015, We've been following closely the trend of the development. This report is very important because it's in studying in depth the investment, the development of the clean energy and also the fossil energy future. And it provides very key in, insights for the energy sector. We know that uh, since uh, last year, we've been seeing that China will play an important role in the future energy investment sector. So how can we make it local and international? This is a very important issue. So today we're going to discuss and exchange views. First of all, I'd like to ask, Mr. Yang Lei, Vice President, Institute of Energy of Beijing University, to welcome you. Distinguished guests, friends, good morning or good afternoon. We are very pleased on behalf of the Beijing University to work once again with the IEA to publish this World Energy Investment Report. On behalf of the organizers, I welcome you. This summer, IEA's DG came to China and came to our university, Beijing University. We also signed an MOU for a future broader cooperation. I remember he said, where is your money? Where is your heart? And uh, so, you know, where the money goes, your heart goes. We know that uh, new energies grow rapidly. And we know that more and more people are paying attention to the future development of energy. So investment is very critical in this topic. And the, the energy transition is bringing more opportunities for investment, for job creation, for better quality of life. So I'm not going to say too many things uh, here. I just want to give the floor to our guests and to our exchange. Uh, maybe one word on the role of the university, because education is very important and is servicing the society. We are touching many issues here. And the Institute of Energy at Beijing University is very pleased to have the opportunity to serve you. So we are waiting for your insights, for your use, and I'd like to thank the our energy network and the International Energy Agency for all your cooperation. Today, through our University in Compass network, we can also see this publication and this event through the media, social media. So from these new ways and means, we can touch more people. I wish you a successful event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yang Lei. 
So I would like to connect with our friends in Beijing, uh, in, from Beijing with Paris. Mr. Tim Gould, Chief Energy Economist, International Energy Agency. Now the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much indeed, uh, dear friends, colleagues. Um, very warm greetings to you from, from Paris, from the headquarters of the International Energy Agency. Um, we are very grateful to you for joining this launch of the IEA's latest World Energy Investment Report, and we're sorry that we are unable to join you in person in Beijing on this occasion. Um, first, I would like to extend special thanks to Dr. Yang Lei, um, the Institute of Energy at Peking University, and to the Energy Foundation China for co-hosting this event, uh, and for their continuous and very much valued support for IEA engagement and work uh, in, in China. So in a minute, I'll pre be presenting our new World Energy Investment Report. This is our flagship look at the state of play for capital flows into the global energy sector. And it focuses on the state of play today, but it also tries to gauge what it means for our joint efforts to create a safer and more sustainable energy system. And while there are certainly positive developments that I'll come to in a minute, uh, we also need to have in mind that there are certainly headwinds from energy security to cost and inflationary pressures, high fuel prices, um, and underlining in many ways the need for investing in solutions to the climate crisis. And I would only echo the words of Dr. Yang Lei in underlining the vital role that energy investments play in the global clean energy transition. And when we think about the trends that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, it's clear that China is central to many of the developments that we have seen in international markets. Um, and I'll be coming back to that uh, in, in a second. But there are also many challenges that remain, including the need for more ambitious policies in many areas, and also the need for much greater international cooperation to mobilize different finance tools. And when we think ahead to the conference of the parties, to COP28 taking place uh, in Dubai, finding common ground on ways to increase clean energy spending, particularly in emerging and developing economies where most of the growth in demand for energy services will take place, that is going to be really a paramount issue um, if we were, want to maintain our 1.5 goal within reach, but also to reach a range of other sustainable uh, development goals. So I look forward very much to hearing from the distinguished experts that are gathered here today about your observations of China's domestic and international energy investments um, within the context, of course, of the dual carbon uh, goals, as well as plans to engage more on clean energy investment internationally and to halt investments in new coal-fired power projects abroad. And let me close these opening remarks by saying that the IEA is fully committed to ongoing dialogues between global actors on how to enhance ambition, enhance ambition together, and to support countries across the world in their clean energy transitions. And I'll be talking a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in that regard based on our global policy and technology um, expertise. We have been producing a variety of analytical publications, roadmaps, regional and country specific reports. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about some joint work we did with the International Finance Corporation earlier this year on how to scale up private finance for clean energy transitions. And also uh, some work that we released very recently on financing clean energy in Africa. So with that, um, I look forward very much to an interesting discussion and thank you once again for your participation here today.
Shall I move on immediately to the presentation of the uh, World Energy Investment 2023? I think that seems to be the best way forward. So let me just um, share my screen and start with some observations from the International Energy Agency on the state of play with um, clean energy investment flows uh, uh, around the world. And a first way to, to think about the process of change in the international uh, capital flows is to look at how investment has evolved when we divide it between investment in fossil fuel supply and investment in clean energy. And by clean energy, we don't just mean renewable power or low emissions power, we mean infrastructure, grids, battery storage. And we also look at the demand side with investments in energy efficiency and electrification and investments into low emission fuels. Um, and when you put all of those elements together, you get the picture that uh, we have on the screen here. So if we cast our minds back to five years ago, there was roughly $2 trillion being invested each year in the global energy sector. And that was split roughly equally between clean energy on the one side and fossil fuels on the other. And at the time, we were concerned that there was simply not enough capital going into the energy sector. This was a very static picture at a time when global energy needs were rising. And we expressed the worry that we were not investing enough to change the system in a more sustainable direction. But we were also nodding enough in the absence of that surge in clean energy investment. We were also not doing enough to maintain the good functioning of the system uh, that we have today. And we were vocal about warning of the consequences of that indecision. And then came the pandemic, then came uh, the global energy crisis, um, and that had a significant implication for the amount of money coming through into fossil fuels. We had a dip, and now we're roughly back to where we were with $1 trillion going into fossil fuel investment. But something has changed on the clean energy side. We've seen a significant acceleration in clean energy investment around the world. And you're looking also at our estimate for what happens this year. So this year, we think that around 1 trillion continues to go into fossil fuels, but the amount going into clean energy is likely to be around 1.7 or even 1.8 um, trillion dollars. And that has a lot of reasons behind it. Um, we think that the economic advantages of clean energy technologies uh, are important. The policy environment has clearly become more supportive um, in many countries. Um, but there are increasingly important considerations of industrial strategy and employment as countries compete for favorable positions in the new clean energy economy. And that is also driving investments in many of these areas. And one of the emblematic illustration of these new investment dynamics comes if we compare the amount of money going into solar investment versus the amount of money going into upstream oil, because solar in many ways is the star of our new report. Um, this is the situation 10 years ago. This was back in 2013 when oil costs were high and, but solar was relatively expensive too. Um, since then, the oil industry has become a lot leaner, but so too has solar been transformed. And it's not just that investment in solar has tripled in dollar terms. Um, it's also the amount of capacity that you get with that investment has risen because costs have come down. So you, you have six times more capacity now being bought um, than you had uh, 10 years ago because of lower costs uh, and economies of scale. So this year we anticipate that more than $1 billion per day will go into solar investment 
including utility scale distributed generation and other technologies. I wanted to broaden out the discussion now and look at all of the major categories that we track for the energy investment picture. Now, we're all aware that in 2022, the oil and gas industry saw record revenues. Um, and upstream investment has been uh, creeping higher. Um, it's set to rise uh, to more than half a trillion dollars in our view this year. But it's striking that even with the record revenues from last year, only a handful of oil and gas companies are spending more in the upstream than they did prior uh, to the pandemic. You can see the 2019 indicator on the screen. And these are mainly the large um, national oil companies um, in the Middle East. So overall, we found that less than half of the cash flow that was available to the oil and gas industry in 2022 was going back into new investments. The majority was being used for dividends, share buybacks, uh, and debt repayments. And that speaks, I think, to the uncertainty that there is in the industry about the future uh, demand. Uh, and I would highlight, I think, one um, piece of analysis that our executive director wrote about in an, in an op-ed in the Financial Times uh, very recently, where he was previewing some of the findings from our new World Energy Outlook, which is coming out in October, and highlighting that this time, this year, for the first time, uh, we are seeing peaks in all of the fossil fuels by the end of this decade. Now, the declines after peak may not be very, very strong in, uh, in, in, in today's policy settings, but it's nonetheless a very significant moment for the global energy economy is coming into view. Um, and I think that speaks to some of the reasons why um, you know, there is a certain amount of hesitation about plowing large amounts of money back into traditional areas of supply. Um, what we are not seeing yet at scale is money going into low emissions fuels. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, in a second. I would like to say a few words about power sector investments. Um, you see immediately the contrast with the fuel supply picture because today, more than 90% of investments in generation are already going into low emission sources. So that's renewables um, and nuclear, whereas fuel supply looks much more traditional. The power sector transition is already much more uh, advanced. And then I'd also like to highlight the demand side. Um, the demand side, we split between efficiency spending and electrification. And there, the, the, the trends are quite distinct. Um, electrification spending, so on heat pumps, on electric mobility, is quite buoyant, it's growing rapidly. We are, though, concerned uh, about um, the relatively static picture that we see for efficiency spending worldwide, given the importance of energy efficiency for our transition goals. But overall, when we consider this investment picture, I think the, the key thing to have in mind is that most of the dynamic elements are around this idea of clean electrification. And there is there are many areas there where, where, where China is already playing a, a, a very significant role. Um, one area that we are worried about, though, is infrastructure, it's grids. Um, there are honorable exceptions, and, and I would certainly include China amongst them. But in many parts of the world, um, grid investments are not keeping up with the pace of change in, in other areas. And that risks becoming a serious constraint on um, renewable investment and on uh, potentially for a risk for also um, electricity security. And you'll be hearing more from the International Agency on this topic. Uh, shortly, we are releasing a special report on grids um, later this month. The geography of this spending is also um, incredibly important. Um, and here, the, when we break down the change in clean energy investment, comparing our estimate for 2023 with the situation in 2019, this only underscores how China is really a clean energy powerhouse and it's leading investment trends for most technologies, from solar to hydropower to nuclear to electric vehicles. 
Um, but there are a host of new policies that are accelerating change in other parts of the world. Um, of course, you're aware of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, but there are policies coming through in the, in the European Union as well. Um, in Japan, India, the pace of change um, is also picking up. But what we are concerned about is the imbalance in overall clean energy spending between what is happening in advanced economies in China and what is happening in the rest of the world. Um, and we cannot afford to see the emergence of new dividing lines in global energy around this participation in the new clean energy economy. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we put a lot of emphasis in our international engagement on how to scale up investments in clean energy in many parts of the emerging developing world. And I'll come back in particular to the question of, of investments in, in, in Africa uh, later on. Um, this, is a, this is an incredibly important moment, I think, for the international community to come together, for countries to show leadership um, in helping um, the world participate in, in, in these, this, these technology opportunities that are opened up uh, today. One other area that I think is, is, is quite strategic is the uh, issue of, of natural gas, um, because quite a major factor affecting today's investment trends has been the need to replace the shortfall in Russian gas deliveries after Russia cut supplies by pipeline to Europe follow, following its invasion of Ukraine. And in response, it's given additional impetus to clean energy deployment in Europe, but it's also been spurring new investments in gas supply uh, and infrastructure. And we have seen a wave uh, of spending on new import capacity for LNG. Um, Europe's expanding its overall LNG import capacity by around one fifth over the period to 2025. And there are import projects uh, growing in, in Asia as well, um, notably in China, which as we all are aware, has been very actively contracting for new LNG in, in recent years. Um, but there's also been um, additional investment in export capacity in the most expensive part of the gas value chain. So um, quite a few projects, notably in North America, have been given the green light um, since the start of 2022. These take time to come to market, but we are seeing a very strong influx of new projects starting operation in around the 2025 to 2027 uh, period, some 150, 170 BCM of annualized new capacity coming into operation and uh, during that two year period. And that is going to have very strong implications um, also for, for, for markets uh, around the world. I wanted to come back uh, a little bit to this question of low emissions fuels. Um, this is just starting to pick up, but it's an area where policy uh, support has become um, increasingly visible. And you can see on these two slides, on the left-hand side, hydrogen electrolysis, on the right-hand side, CCUS, you can see the impact of some of the new policy measures that have been announced by governments around the world. These are announced projects, so we don't have guarantees that they would all come through. And But there is the prospect from a very low base of a much more active international sector around clean hydrogen production and around carbon capture utilization and storage. I think where we have um, some concerns on the hydrogen side is that we do see a bit of a mismatch in the international discussion. Lots of emphasis on new supply. There needs to be much more emphasis on who is gonna be using that low emissions demand. Are the policies in place to encourage uh, demand also for uh, low emission hydrogen. And we'll be talking more about this on Friday when we release the next uh, edition of our global hydrogen review. I wanted to say also a few words about investment in clean energy supply chains, because that's a, a major focus of area for policymakers, investors, and indeed uh, for the IEA. And on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm taking the example here uh, of batteries because record sales of EVs, strong investments in battery storage for power uh, and a push from policymakers 
to scale up domestic supply chains. Uh, we've seen a really wave of new lithium ion battery manufacturing projects around the world. Um, and today, as we're all aware, um, China has a very strong position in global battery manufacturing. In fact, it has a, a very strong position in uh, pretty much every aspect of the clean energy supply chain, with a possible exception of the mining uh, of critical uh, minerals. And the announced projects that we've seen uh, around the world, they do um, you know, bring down that, that overall share uh, of China in global uh, manufacturing uh, capacity. But China remains an immensely important player, um, even if all of those projects uh, come to fruition. But one of the questions that we also have is, are we going to see the adequate supplies of critical minerals to keep up uh, with demand? And we are also now tracking um, the investments made in new critical mineral supply. And what you're looking at on the, on the right-hand side of the screen is that those investments are picking up. Thanks to high prices, growing policy support, investments in critical mineral mining, um, they rose by 30% in 2022. And we're also seeing quite a strong growth in exploration spending in quite a diverse group of countries. Canada, Australia, activities growing in Brazil, other parts of Latin America, and in resource-rich countries in Africa. But moving from exploration to new production can take a long time. There can be often difficulties with permitting um, so that we remain concerned that uh, critical mineral investment will become a constraining factor for clean energy technology manufacturing and deployment. A few words here on sustainable finance, and we use here a sort of proxy for that discussion, the sustainable debt issuance. Um, that has grown very significantly over recent years. Um, but what I wanted to highlight here is the potential mismatch in sustainable debt issuance between you know, the growth and where that sustainable finance is really needed. Um, because the, what we would like to see much more of is ways to channel some of that sustainable finance flows into emerging developing economies. And um, you can see on the right-hand side, there's, the, there's a mismatch at the moment between sustainable debt issuance and where clean energy spending um, needs to be. Um, but also we need to find ways to bring some of that sustainable finance into sectors that have difficult transitions. And by that, I mean some of the energy intensive sectors, some of the carbon intensive sectors. Um, I was uh, listening recently to a, uh, a speech by, uh, by Mark Carney on this topic. And he said something which seems very, um, self-evident in a way, um, but is not necessarily the way that this market operates at the moment. He said that we need to bring the finance to where the emissions are. And I think that's an important thing for us to have in mind that we need to ally some of these sustainable finance flows to those energy intensives, to those carbon intensive sectors where they have credible uh, transition plans. Finally, what does all this mean for the future, how do these trends match up against our, uh, our global goals and our, our global needs? Um, as I mentioned at the start, we have seen a, an acceleration in clean energy investment. And if that continues, if that continues to grow to 2030, as it has over the last two years, then overall spending, particularly on that clean electrification piece, which is in green on the screen, would be matching the aggregate amount that we need for meeting national climate goals, national net zero targets. So that's the APS, the announced pledges scenario. That's the middle of our, of our scenario uh, indicators there. But we would need a further acceleration to get on track for the, what we're referring to here is the NZD, the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, which is consistent with a 1.5 degree limit on, on, on global warming. But we are aware, of course, that maintaining high growth rates is tough, um, that there are some headwinds facing uh, clean energy projects around the world from bottlenecks in supply chains, from higher costs in, uh, in some areas. 
Um, and these will need to be ironed out if we're going to see those growth rates maintained. And we need to see growth not only in clean electrification, but as you're saying, in grids, in efficiency, in low emissions fuels as well. And some of those areas are lagging behind. And the most important thing, we need to see a much more broad-based flow of capital to a, a range of economies around the world, uh, including emerging and developing economies. And if we are successful in scaling up that clean energy investment picture, then that has implications too for the amount of capital that needs to go into fossil fuels. Um, there's two messages from this chart. One is the interrelationship of our clean energy scale up with the amount of capital that needs to go into fossil fuels. But I think it was also instructive to have in mind that the energy sector needs to attract new sources of capital. It is not sufficient simply to redeploy money that currently goes to fossil fuels into clean energy. We need to make the energy sector as a whole a uh, more attractive proposition for, uh, for, for, for clean energy uh, or for energy investors in general or investment uh, investors in, in, in broad parts of the global economy. A final word on um, some work which we released very recently at the Africa um, Climate Action Summit on financing clean energy in Africa. And I use this as an example uh, of some of the regional work that we do alongside the tracking in the uh, world energy investment, because the imbalance uh, of clean energy capital is particularly striking when you look at Africa. Africa is nearly 20% of the global population, um, but only around 2% of the world's um, clean energy investment. And that should be ringing alarm bells uh, for all of us because we really need a massive scale up in order to reach access and state sustainable development goals. So a lot of the work that we're doing in these areas is focusing on identifying reasons why the cost of capital is so high. What are the countrywide or energy project specific risks that need to be addressed um, to bring down uh, the cost of capital? Um, and you can see also here how we need to be scaling up investments across a range of technologies, including infrastructure, um, in, in order to meet access goals and other uh, sustainable uh, development goals as well. And investments at this scale are clearly well beyond the reach of, of public finance alone, uh, especially at a time when so many countries are facing high debt repayments, um, debt service costs in Africa in aggregate are now double the level of, of clean energy investment. So uh, a strong message here is that much more needs to be done by the international community to bring all African countries into the emerging uh, clean energy economy, including much greater financial and technical support. And that means also significantly more um, concessional finance. That needs to scale up by a factor of 10 this decade, in our view, in order to mitigate country and project risks and to bring in much more um, private capital. And I think we need to be very smart in how we deploy scarce public funds to make sure that we're maximizing the potential uh, the leverage that we can gain um, in terms uh, uh, of getting uh, private investors involved. There I would leave it. Um, I hope that's given a, a flavor of some of the sorts of trends that we're identifying here at the International Energy Agency. Um, this is ongoing work. Um, we are producing regular updates and we would be more than happy to share those insights as we develop, but also to listen carefully to your views on these issues and to see how China, which makes such an important contribution to all of the trends that we are that we are looking at, uh, will evolve its policies and strategies in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Tim, for this excellent report. We know that the future is bright, but there are many challenges facing us, especially uh, as far as investment is concerned. China is also facing challenges, and uh, we have many issues to be 
uh, discussed here at this uh, exchange. Would like to hear the experts and uh, would like to know what they think about our future. So I'd like to hand the microphone to Mr. Xie Chou-ye. He's uh, the senior advisor in Electric Power Planning and Engineering Institute. He will be the moderator for the roundtable discussion. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Tim Gordon, the Chief Energy Economist of IEA. I'd like to thank IEA and the Beijing University for inviting me here as the moderator of the roundtable section. So I'd like to invite our guests to the podium. First of all, it's Ms. Cui Ying. Deputy Director General of the International Institute of Green Finance. He, she is at the Central University of Finance Economics with nearly 20 years of experience in green finance and carbon market mechanisms. And then is Mr. Wang Shen. He's the senior researcher of Beijing Institute of Green Finance and Sustainable Development. He used to work in Total and other energy companies and has rich experience in green financing the energy industry. Now comes Ms. Huang Wei, Vivian, Energy Strategy Officer at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Mr. Li Peng, he's the Deputy Director of the Department of Strategy and Planning at the State Power Investment Corporation. He has worked for the National Energy Administration and drafted many policies on new energy development. He has also very rich experience. Today online, we have an expert from IEA. It's a Madame Emma Gordon. She's an energy and investment policy analyst at IEA and the lead author of the report Financing Clean Energy in Africa. Welcome to you all. Please take a seat. IEA for years has been publishing World Energy Investment Report, and this is a very good contribution to the energy transition, especially investment for the world, because the report gives out very constructive views and is very helpful to every country. Even in China, we can take lessons from the report. Today, we are going to talk about a few topics. With the launch of this report, we invited experts for to hear their insights and their views. I'd like to see their views what is the impact of energy investment on the global energy transition, especially in the clean energy. From the report presentation, we know that investment in clean energy has been accelerating and uh, increasing. In China, we said that in 2030, China will continue to reach the target of uh, energy peak. And uh, we are facing new challenges, but also opportunities. So what are they? As a big country, China has to be prepared to have a lower emission energy transition our firms and 
industry? How can they take part in the construction of the future with other countries of the world? So we would like to hear your views. First of all, Madam Chui Ying, how does China's green financial system support the development of clean energy? So we can hear from you what you uh, have been working on this, and also how can transition finance play a role in the energy transition, especially in the low emission energy. So Madam Tsui, you have to be the first. Thank you, Monsieur She. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to take part in this uh, launch of the report. From the presentation, we heard there's a sustainable finance in the report and also research about this topic. My institution is uh, working in this uh, green finance transition. And uh, we have been also studying what is going on in other countries. And also since uh, August, uh, the, our People's Bank has also talked about uh, the green finance. What is green finance? It's supporting the climate change, energy saving, and uh, prevention from the green side. Energy is the most important sector. So green finance has been designed to meet the needs of the transition and to be supportive. So the green finance structure is to predict what we can do for green and clean energy. For example, wind power, solar power or photovoltaic modules. All the financial products have to be designed to meet the needs of this future development. In general, the regulation of China has also tabled a few plans. For example, the People's Bank has uh, tabled a few rules and regulations to regulate the finance products and the credits, borrowing money, have to provide a credit and have the financial support. Moreover, there are incentives, for example, the subsidies for financial products if you issue a financial product, you can have a subvention from the state. Moreover, there's a new products to be developed. So we had also other instruments, and this is what is attracting attention. So this can benefit directly to clean energy projects. It focuses on clean energy, including wind and PV. And also it includes storage, grids, etc., and other infrastructure project, which complements uh, clean energy generation. Other than that, this is also a framework that supports CCU as another clean energy technologies. So this is so this is a way how the PBOC helps uh, the market with a lower interest rate. Of course, um, there will be people spend well uh, will shoulder a loss. But they can ask for another loan with a lower interest rate at 1.7, 1.75%. So which is a mechanism that 
at the end will support clean energy projects. So this is also another instrument in the area of green finance in China. So now a lot of the instruments are goal-oriented, result-oriented. Some of the projects, if they have a better performance, maybe they can negotiate a lower interest rate. Or if the project is greener, the greener it is, the cheaper the interest rate, the lower the interest rate. In addition, there's also ABS as an instrument uh, for wind power generation. So this is a way uh, to solve the problem of upfront spending. Other than that, um, there are also other instrument of financing. There's a company who will buy all the equipments for your project, and then you borrow these equipments. And afterward, these projects, after making enough money, they pay back the company. So another area is um, green insurance. There's also a large range of products of green insurance. So we see a lot of innovations trying to support clean energy development in China. So Mr. Xia mentioned uh, the clean energy transition for energy transition. For the last few years, we put a lot of attention at uh, the green sector with the dual carbon goals. We know that to realize these goals, now we're still focusing on um, those sectors with uh, high emissions. And now there are several standards being published. So last year, Indonesia being the presidency of G20, there was a framework being published. So this is called um, transition finance. This framework focuses on high emitting companies like sustainably sustainability linked bonds slbs so this is not a traditional bonds that's a traditional bond it is it entails the pledges of the issuer the issuer will promise that we'll achieve a certain goal by uh, within two years and once the goal is reached the slbs will not uh, uh, will, will not have any will not have extra cost so these are all different products to better support energy, the energy transition. So the financial system has been redesigned in order to support this transition. We see a lot of innovations to transition toward a more greener financial system. So I'll stop here for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tui. So next, I'd like to ask Professor Wang to talk about the volatility of energy prices. Yes, indeed, we see that. Recently, we see volatility in the energy market, and it has impacted uh, decision making. And so the question is how how can we make decision of uh, energy, like investment in energy sector? So what is your take on it? Thank you, Mr. Xie. 
So today, I'm going to talk about how energy prices, um, how does it impact final investment decision, FID, and also how energy prices influence uh, energy transition. So before answering the question, I would like to see a few words on the presentation of Tim. The presentation is very exhaustive. I'll just highlight some of the important figures. He mentioned 2.8 trillion US dollar as the total investment in 2022 in the energy sector all over the world. So 2.8 trillion can be divided into two parts, 1.7 trillion in clean energy and 1.1 trillion in fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. So if we look at the 1.1 trillion more in detail, you see that some of them is in coal, some of them is in gas and oil. I think the numbers, the figures are very important. 1.7 to 1. This is the clean energy investment versus investment in traditional energy. 1.721. to This is an important figure. This is the global average. In the figure in China, in US, in Europe, I believe there are different ratio. I believe that in China, the ratio might be higher. Whereas the global average is 1.7. This is an important read of findings of this report. So also in the report, we heard that in 2022, our investment in traditional energy went up again. So this is closely related to the question Mr. Xie asked me. It has to do with geopolitical tension, like uh, an invasion in Ukraine. So this event triggered the energy prices. So I have a background of physics. I'm also from Beijing University. I like to simplify questions, simplify our problems. If when we look at the energy sector, we see that it has been through different cycles. From 2014 to 2020, we see that the prices were low. The oil price lowest was at 30. 30 US dollar a barrel, and now is about 100 US dollar. Actually, when the energy prices go up, people are more likely to invest in the sector. So since last year, because of the high energy prices, a lot of companies, they are more able, they have more money to invest again. So some of the charts in the presentation are very uh, important. We see that oil, some oil and gas companies, a lot of their, um, a lot of their revenue, a lot of their, their income goes back to uh, their stockholders. Because in the past, usually it goes back to investing in their infrastructure. However, last year, we saw that maybe 50% went to their stockholders. So if we translate it into a more simple way, we can see that so oil and company, gas companies are making good money. So they didn't need to invest again in their energy. They can, they can spend his money on dividends to their stockholders. So if you are familiar with the energy sector, you know that this is quite unprecedented in the last decade. So for example, your income is 100 billion. Maybe you will spend 70 to 80 billion 
again to your infrastructure and you don't have enough money for dividends anymore. But in this report, we say that there is more than 50% of their uh, of their income went to uh, dividends. So another important thing about this report, again, is the racial 1.721. I think this is uh, the figure that will have an influence on our decision making. Energy prices and carbon price, the price of carbon. So for now, we haven't seen uh, many studies on the correlation between energy prices and the carbon price. But in the future, we believe that the correlation between these two will have an impact on the racial that I just mentioned, racial of clean energy investment and traditional energy investment. The interplay between energy price and the carbon price will sustainably impact the racial of the clean energy investment over the traditional energy investment. So this is uh something i want to highlight so again when you look at carbon pricing uh the construction of a carbon market uh took us a lot of time what i would like to say here is that carbon pricing of course it depends on the carbon market there are several markets in the world but we don't have any studies until today what is the correlation between energy prices and carbon pricing and how this correlation uh, influence the racial, the famous racial that I mentioned earlier. So when the price of carbon is higher, of course, as an investor, I would direct my money to new energy. So I can only by uh, earn money by buying CCER. But if the price of carbon is lower, I don't have enough incentives. If it's like only 10 RMB or 20 RMB, I don't have enough return. Of course, when investing, you focus on your return. The carbon price is low. Of course, I won't have enough um, incentive to invest in the clean energy sector. So now, the next question, how can we boost the carbon price? So two ratios, the ratio of energy prices and carbon price, and also the ratio of clean energy investment versus traditional energy investment. So these are some important figures we should pay attention to. I read the report in detail. I believe that, again, the ratio between prices, how does it impact investment, the ratio between two types of investments. So I believe we would like to see more the link between the two racial that I mentioned. I believe if we have a clear idea of the correlation between the two, I believe you will point a clear direction for our future. Thank you very much, Mr. Wong. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Indeed, this ratio 1.7 is very important. For the technology side, we have to promote the transition. This is uh, very important. It's the basis. But during the transition, on the financial side, on the investment support, we have to have a booster. Therefore, I'm inviting Madame Huang Wei as a financial institution for Asia and the world. Please share your bank's observations on energy transition investment in Asia 
especially what challenges are faced by energy transition investment and what can a multilateral bank like yours uh, address these talent challenges. Moreover, for Chinese uh, investments or institutions, what are the short-term prospects and opportunities for China, China's foreign energy investments? So I'd like to ask Madame Huang Wei to share her views. Thank you, Mr. Yang and Professor Xie. Please allow me to answer in English because it's my working language. English, sorry. Uh, so Mr. Wang um, just shared um, his the key messages for him from from the report, and I would also like to share um, the key message that I that you know occurred to me as quite alarming uh, from reading the re re report. Um, so Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and our primary focus is really to promote infrastructure development um, in the developing countries in Asia. So. Uh, there are three messages. One is uh, relating to developing countries. So one is that more than 90% of the increase in clean energy investment since 2021 were in advanced economies in China. So this is in stark contrast um, to the, uh, where the demand is. Particularly in Asia, we expect that um, two thirds um, of the energy demand growth will come from uh, this region. So that makes us think uh, if we were to achieve net zero, then we need to do something about the developing countries. And secondly, um, which was not presented, but was in the report is that grid investments in emerging countries actually declined during the past two years compared to previous years in developing countries on the back of financial constraint um, faced by the utilities and also debt crisis experienced by governments. And the third message was that there is a large investment gap gap in energy efficiency in emerging economies. And the gap is as large as 10 times um, if you compare what is being invested now and what is needed on, under a net zero transition. And so this is really alarming and unfortunately is also in line with our observation on the ground. So I'm often asked by people, you know, um, Ms. Huang, why do you think there is a lack of financing in developing countries for, for energy transition? And my answer is always that actually there's no lack of financing as such because all the financing institutions now have their climate commitments and we, we are all extremely, uh, you know, working extremely hard to try to expand our green portfolio, our climate portfolio. So what is really lacking, I think, are two things. One is the um, projects that are bankable, uh, so bankability of projects. Um, so this is um, projects we can, which can generate enough cash flow with a high probability that could pay back their investments um, to the, the banks, to the, to the developers. And the various reasons for that, of course, policy environment um, on one hand, but on the other hand, um, the risk um, coming from the off-takers and also the cost of capital and the cost um, of supplies. So now, now we're seeing like a wind, wind industry, for example, has continued um, you know, to be um, dragged back um, by, by the supply chain issues. And the second thing that's lacking is structures that could bridge the gap um, between the funding and the projects. So clean energy projects are very different by nature um, compared to the traditional energy infrastructure and also much smaller in size as well. So um, take the example as um, you know, Chinese companies investing overseas. So it used to be like, okay, there's a 500 megawatt coal power plant. So let's get uh, um, you know, financing a, a loan from the China Development Bank and let's get a guarantee from uh, Exim Bank. Then the project happens. And the government side, uh, because large uh, project size, they're willing to share risks uh, with the developers and negotiate on the terms. But what happens now is that there's a 10 megawatt here, there's a 15 megawatt what there. Um, so, so they're looking for like a million here and a half a million there. And on the other hand, the government um, is much less, it has much more higher leverage um, over the developers and push more risks to the developers. So how can we bridge 
these gaps and also looking for more innovative structures to finance these smaller projects. And so particularly on that point, I think uh, AIB has um, been doing a lot of work on this in this area and uh, particularly how to um, try to see how to, we leverage our um, pool of financial instruments and our relationship um, with local financiers, uh, including local banks and also developer uh, the plat uh, investment platforms established by developers or financial institutions or equity funds, um, etc. So try to channel our funds through um, these more local um, platforms and um, for them to reach the renewable energy projects. And so I think that's very important. And, and just to share with you some data. Uh, so AIB since our inception in 2016, we have invested in um, direct investment in energy um, is about one, uh, in renewable energy is about 1.8 billion. But actually we're doing much, much more through financial intermediaries. So through the, this kind of platforms or, or intermediaries that I mentioned, um, that size amounts to 1.7 million to 4.8 million billion. So, so it's really much larger. Um, and I think going forward um, for developing countries to, re, um, to um, experience the kind of uh, growth that we're seeing in advanced economies on energy transition investments, we really need to be more agile in responding to the market demand um, and uh, also you know, leverage whatever resource we could to tackle these pain points that um, that uh, impact the the cash flow and the, the bankability of projects. Uh, so maybe just let me stop there for now. Thank you, Madam Huang, for your sharing your views. Mr. Gould, in his presentation, you already heard that more than once he said. China has been working a lot in the transition to clean energy and we invested a lot and also had good results. In general, we can say that we contributed to the conversion transition to the clean energy of the world. In China, we have many financial institutions and also industries of the energy sector who took part in this transition. Chinese government tabled a few policies to promote this transition. So today we're very pleased to have Mr. Li Peng because he's working in the State Power Investment Corporation Department of Strategy and Planning. He also worked in the administration. So clean energy installed capacity has gone beyond 55%. Now it's already 67%. So this is really what China has been doing. And we can see the tangible results. I'd like to invite Mr. Li Peng to talk about how to judge the future cost trend of new energy. What is the cost structure of new energy consumption by users in the future? How to develop this area and also what is the focus of cost reduction for green consumption in the future because we are all very uh, interested in knowing the structure of the cost and the future trend mr lee i'm very honored to hear today the presentation about the, the report and in the report, we've seen that many trends have been reversed in recent years. Since the pandemic, it's the first time, we can say the first year of recovery. And we've seen many exciting trends. And it will be in favor to the future energy transition. First of all, the 
PV's cost in six months it has been reduced of 50 percent it's 50 percent down moreover the storage batteries also its cost has been low down for 50 percent in six months so i've been already exchanging with IEA's colleagues, I said it's not because China gave uh, subsidies because we don't have uh, so ma many subsidies. It's really a trend. It's happening. The cost is down. More less than one month ago, there's a very exciting cost for example, the wind power offshore, it's uh, within $300. Two years ago, it was $1,000. And uh, wind power on the sea offshore is 2.1 yuan. It's like uh, 2 cents US dollars. So renewable energy is having a lower cost. And this is already a very sound basis to promote the future development of uh, energy transition to cleaner energy. I just said that the cost of wind power offshore is 2.1 cent US dollars, but we haven't felt the difference. So in the future, not only we have to invest in new energies, we have to invest in the grid and also to have a big change because uh, uh, PV or solar power or uh, wind power are very important, but also electric vehicles last year has been more than 25% of penetration. This is a big change. In the past, when we talked about the 10% of penetration in 10 years, nobody would have believed it. But now you are seeing it's coming true. So the PVs penetration, EVs penetration are very obvious. And also the cost of power generation is uh, less. So how can we have this uh, lower cost uh, power generation be known by the general public. We have to change our way of functioning. It's only by doing so that we can reach the energy transition. We've been working a lot in recent years from our state power investment corporation side to have uh, a green electrification. We have been constructing in this field. So now with new energy, we're making energy closer to our end users. So with a lower cost of generation, we want to increase the penetration of new energy. In the modern power system, I believe we can solve the problems that we're facing currently. In the report, I, I saw the focus, a focus on Africa. Actually, the African continent is rich in resources. with one third of uh, the desert area. I believe with uh, a PV farm installed, they can provide energy for people around the world. So I believe that once we have the proposal, once we have a concrete project, 
I believe that it addressed to the problem of energy access, which is also affordable for the people. So we always think that this kind of project should be should be supported by actors all over the world. We have our own advantages. Uh, when I was talking to my European colleagues, some of them thought that, how can this be so cheap? How can uh, renewable energy, clean energy be so cheap in China? Is it true that you don't have subsidies anymore? But it is true. I believe that this is our advantage in China. And in Germany, they ha also have their own advantage, advantages. So we believe that working together, leveraging our advantages, we can push forward the global energy transition. Nobody can work on its own. So we have to work together in order to achieve this goal of energy transition. The SBIC has been open to all types of collaboration. And in our recent visit to Europe, we've been expressing this, uh, our willingness to collaborate with uh, colleagues all over the world to address problems related to the clean energy. So then we can make the market bit bigger. If one day Africa is a big investment market, I believe this is a very promising market. Thank you, Mr. Lee, Director Lee. So we also have Ms. Emma Gordon with us, joining us online. I, uh, in the report, I noticed that uh, the report also addresses problem of energy transition in Africa and also tracks the current investment in the sector. We have to double our investment uh, by 2030. There's still a lot, a lot of space for improvement. And of course, we need more money in the work in Africa. So, Ms. Gordon, can you talk briefly about what are the opportunities and challenges facing energy investment in Africa? And how can we address these challenges? Ms. Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I hope you can all hear me. So the first thing to highlight is that obviously there is a lot of variety uh, across African countries and technologies. And as you identified, for the continent as a whole to achieve universal energy access and the successful implementation of their NDCs, energy investment does indeed need to double from the level today uh, to 2030. And as highlighted by uh, the panel, the, the continent is rich in opportunities. So 60% of the world's best solar resources are found in Africa. But the projects that need financing range from small scale energy access projects, sometimes in conflict prone or, or fragile states, right through to those um, larger infrastructure projects, including in some markets where which are more proven, so South Africa or Egypt, for example. And obviously, funding from China has played a, a large role uh, in, in Africa to date. Uh, so China accounts for about a, a fifth of the lending to the continent, much of which um, is concentrated in energy and infrastructure. But this type of financing, this debt financing for large infrastructure projects is really only one piece of the puzzle. And one of the things we found in the report is that before you can get into um, this, to that point of raising debt, you need to increase the number of projects that can reach bankability. And to get to that, you need the right enabling environment and you need finance um, to help companies and projects uh, in that pre-development phase. And often that requires a lot of equity capital uh, or grant capital, uh, since much of those activities, many of those activities are not necessarily profit-making. And this is particularly clear when you look at energy access projects. And the reason we emphasize energy access projects is 
simply because of the scale of the need uh, in the African context. There are still over 600 million people who lack access to electricity and nearly 1 billion who lack access to clean cooking. And these energy access projects require um, around about 25 billion US dollars in, uh, in spending per year between now and 2030. While that's a, a small drop in terms of global energy investment, it's about 1% of global energy investment. Um, these projects are particularly difficult to finance. And in the report, we look at how affordable these projects are for end users. And we found that only about half of electricity access projects are affordable to end users without subsidies. So that really emphasizes the role that concessional capital, particularly grant capital, will need to play. One other area we look at quite closely is the cost of capital. Um, and because the risks in many African countries are higher or at least perceived to be higher um, than in North America, Europe, or China, this is reflected in the financing costs. So the cost of capital in Africa is at least two to three times higher than in Europe, North America, or China. And this makes it much harder to get energy projects off the ground. And it also increases the risk of pushing up the cost of power for the projects that are implemented. Um, one of the things that these various areas point to is that achieving the uptick in investment will rely on increasing the share of concessional finance and really tailoring that finance to support greater mobilization of private capital. And the report highlighted a, a series of case studies where we see private capital uh, playing a key role, um, including through newer financing instruments, such as some of the sustainable finance instruments that we discussed earlier on the panel, green bonds, sustainability linked bonds, um, and also through local currency guarantees. But one of the big challenges in, in African markets is that unlike in developing countries in Asia, for example, local capital is very sparse. So generally speaking, the local banking sector and local capital markets are quite shallow outside of about five countries of the 50 um, found in the region. So finding new ways to leverage more, fine, more private finance and to grow the role of local capital markets will be particularly vital. And that still requires a significant amount of de-risking, uh, primarily from concessional sources uh, of finance. And that's where we see things like uh, blended finance playing a particularly important role going forward. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gordon, for sharing with us. So, for this is uh, we're going to wrap up this panel, and we'll um have a Q and A right now. So, we welcome any questions, any questions to our panelists today. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. So, good morning. So I would like to ask about the PV sector in China. The, the pace of development, is it too fast or too slow? This is a question for Mr. Xie. Yeah, for Mr. Xie. But also maybe uh, Mr. Li Pong, his question. PV development, PV sector development in China, too fast or too slow? Okay, this is not an easy question. Uh, uh, I actually, I didn't catch your question. So for the solar PV sector, we all know that we see many figures that that it has its uh, experienced some explosive growth. I would like to know, is this development phase normal or is it too fast or too slow? Okay, thank you. So I think there are two parts of your question. One is the generation side, the supply side. And the second part of your question concerns the power system, the power system, or in terms of distributed generation. You want to ask more on the supply side or the, the generation side? 
Can you be more deep? Can you be more specific? So, to answer your question briefly, first of all, in terms of supply, we are also so we're a very important player in the world. So this is one of our uh, strategy. So it illustrates our emphasis on new energy transition. So second of all, concerning the power system, we're still in the planning phase. So we have to consider it alongside with the development and also the demand. For the last few years, we saw some uh, trend of curtailments of wind and solar. But recently, I believe uh, the renewables, new energy were used in a more um, optimal way. So, Mr. Lee, yes, um, actually, I believe that the development speed corresponds with uh, how fast the cost has been going down. So, in 2021, capacity was at 54 gigawatt, and today, if I mean more than 100 gigawatt already. So it's the same for electric vehicles. Um, so it all corresponds with how fast the cost has been going down. But for electric vehicles, the sales, even with the most optimistic estimation, we're not going to double the sales this year. For solar PV, in the beginning of this year, people were estimating probably reach 120 gigawatts. And if we don't have a massive curtailment, we believe that it is still growing in a reasonable pace. We haven't seen any massive curtailment for now. We also see that the now the prices the energy prices is fluctuating alongside with the market mechanism so we believe that this is a normal pace and we have to maintain this normal pace of development and if we maintain this base pace for several years We, of course, if the fa if the pace is too fast, if the development pace is too fast, of course, we'll see some massive curtailments. But today, solar panel, the cost of solar panel has gone down drastically. So we have to think about if we see curtailment in the future, we have to think about what is the real problem. Are we moving forward too fast? So at least currently, the PV is increasingly at a rational speed. There are fluctuations, but uh, there won't be a huge reduction in the future, I don't think. Otherwise, we can't explain it. Next, third row, this lady. Thank you. I have two questions. First question to Mr. Wang. In explaining the report, you said that 2020, half of the funds were return to investors, especially to the big companies in of the West. Therefore, there are people not happy. So why is it this? The energy big companies 
are beneficiary? Why it's the return of investment to the shareholders and not to the reinvestment of equipment? Very good question. Easy answer. It's because when the oil price is down, there are a lot of money which didn't return to the investors. So last year, they need to compensate the shareholders. In 2014, the price of the barrel was really low and uh, until 2021, the world oil price was very low. In the IEA's report, it's very well drafted. In recent years, very little money were was returned to the shareholders. But last year, in 2022, because of the price increase, the shareholders could be compensated. That's why we had this, uh, we seen this last year. Moreover, Mr. Wang, uh, Mr. Huang from ADB, in Singapore, they are working on the import, import of cross-border electricity. So is this a way of uh, the market force to promote this kind of uh, um, imbalance? Or we should go through multilateral negotiations to make it fairer. So what is it in the Southeast Asia in the investment, uh, cross-border investment, please? Thank you. Thank you for your question. This question is very important to ADB. Thematic priority is thematic priority is very important for us for our investment if we look back to the projects of our past investment energy investment cross border is very difficult because you need first have a long term negotiation between countries to finally have this connection. In the past, uh, we had projects of this uh, cross-border connection was in Laos, and uh, we invested uh, in a project of uh, 600 megawatts. The power generation was to be provided to Vietnam. So, there was an MOU saying that under this cooperation framework, we can have this, 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 and that. So this is a very big picture a framework. But in the Southeast Asia, in the past years, we see that we saw that in Malaysia, they didn't want to provide any energy out of the border because they need it nationally. So they were backing up to the cross-border projects. But uh, since last year, in S Indonesia and Singapore, they have been loosening up this uh, kind of restrictions on cross-border investment. But in, in the, how, how do you have uh, this uh, benefit sharing between the government and the industry? This is very difficult because, uh, for example, in Indonesia, you need uh, to have the ground base in Indonesia. Then the ground is uh, it belongs to the to the government. And then if you earn money, how do you share with the government and the industry? So there's a lot of uncertainty. In the end, maybe we have to negotiate and uh, consult the government and maybe come back to these kind of projects. I'm sorry, time is up, time is up, yes. Can we accept one question? Because 
this person has been raising his hand for a long time. Fourth row, fourth row. Sorry. Can I speak in English? You mentioned about the carbon price and its uh, role in uh, incentivizing a greater share of uh, clean energy. Um, the carbon market in, in China, um, of course, is unique in the way that it, its allocation is based on a, an intensity-based allocation of quotas rather than a, an overall uh, cap. Um, and that um, does create incentive for uh, lowering emissions in the coal sector, but not actually fuel switching um, to lower emission fuels, that incentive is missing because that cap isn't there. So I'm just wondering, uh, I, know, I know a lot of people in the carbon market space um, think that that's a shift that should happen in, in, in the future in China's carbon market. What steps do you think need to happen before we get there? Are there obstacles that, that make that difficult, that need some work, or what, what are the things that need to happen before that change is made? Thanks. Uh, this is a very good question about the carbon market and also the in connection with the carbon price, right? And to answer your question in a very short fashion um, is there are many steps to do. Yeah. First, I think uh, China market, we have to admit that the Chinese carbon market at some point is different from the carbon market, for example, in the EU, but deeply connected. The deeply connected, for example, like currently we have a common ground taxonomy. The common ground taxonomy laid the foundation for the China's uh, carbon market to connect with the EU, uh, for example, European carbon market. I think that's a very important step. The common ground taxonomy, that's the very first and also very substantive step for China's market to be connected with the EU market. The second step, as you mentioned, obviously, and you're expert on the carbon market and also uh, international um, carbon price. I think the second uh, step, and also China is doing now, is the reopening of CCER. Uh, the reopening of CCER basically uh, let's use the you know, economic term is to make the market more liquid. Because once the market, we call the jump start, right? If we do not jump start the carbon market, let alone the, the later steps, we have to jump start the China's uh, carbon market by reopening the CCER. So, so CCER is a, uh, China certified emission reduction. And this CCER is very critical. And the third step, as I mentioned during my uh, opening speech, is I encourage all of people here uh, to think about the, carbon, the interplay between the carbon price and energy price. The energy price, simply speaking, let's just use oil price. For, for example, now the oil price is like $90 or $100. If you take the ratio of the oil price versus carbon price, and then compare it with the ratio of the clean investment versus the, the traditional uh, investment, and then draw a correlation between these two, I believe you will find something very interesting. Let's go some extreme, uh, because I'm from the mathematics and the physics point of view. If the carbon price is zero, which means this ratio is infinitive, what does mean the carbon price is zero? Which means we don't care about the clean energy. Of course, that is not reality, right? Just to put some extreme to do the limitation. And then the ratio of the clean investment versus the, uh, uh, the uh, traditional investment would be zero. So next step, what I'm Thank you for your question. I'm suggesting is that we draw a correlation between these ratios. I call the ratios of the uh, energy price versus carbon price and the ratio of the clean investment versus the traditional investment. And then I believe there will be something very spectacular and very substantive will be found. Thank you. Uh, how, thank you. Thank you uh, to our panelists today. So we're going to wrap up this session. So thank you for our panelists today to uh, discuss the World Energy Investment 2023.
we appreciate all the insights in this report and this is indeed uh, insightful for experts in the energy sector it's inspiring in many ways we also hope that the IEA can continue to release every year uh, the World Energy Investment Report. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, our panelists today. Thank you again. So we're glad to have this a uh, very interesting panel today. I believe we all learned many things. We all learned a lot. We have a WeChat group uh, of this uh, report lunch event, and we can discuss our insights afterwards after this event. So now I would like to um, invite Ms. Cecilia Tam to uh, give us a closing remark. The floor is yours, Ms. Tam. Thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, colleagues, thank you for joining our launch of the World Energy Investment Report. Many thanks also to our student panel of experts for sharing their insights about clean energy investments and sustainable finance in China and beyond. In closing, I'd like to share with you three takeaways from this lively discussion. First, China's clean energy sector has benefited from strong policy support, including access to affordable finance through its network of financial institutions. This has helped to drive down technology costs in record time and promoted faster than expected adoption in technologies such as EVs, solar, and offshore wind. Secondly, outside of China, emerging and developing countries continue to struggle to access affordable capital. While finance is available for bankable clean energy projects, many countries still lack an adequate policy environment that can provide the cash flows necessary to secure the capital which is available to finance bankable clean energy projects. To solve this, more conceptual funding to help do this project will play an important role in filling this gap. And finally, international collaboration and support will be critical to achieve the global clean energy transition. Chinese companies are actively financing clean energy projects domestically and also looking for opportunities abroad to invest in clean energy projects. Before we close this event, let me highlight a few items that the IEA um, is uh, working on. On the 26th of September, we will release an update of our net zero roadmap. The first report published in 2021 lays out a global pathway to keep the 1.5 uh, degree target within reach. And in mid-October, we will be hosting a workshop focusing on sustainable finance for clean energy in ASEAN, drawing on policies and measures implemented in China and other ASEAN uh, economies. This event will convene international energy and sustainable finance policymakers and experts to share experiences with sustainable debt instruments to fund clean energy projects. And then uh, ahead of this event, we plan to publish a commentary that looks at sustainable debt issuances in China, including a focus on the use of these instruments for transition activities. Uh, the World Energy Investment Report, as mentioned by Tim Gould in his opening remarks, is an annual publication. Going forward, we welcome collaboration with all the experts and institutes uh, present today. Um, and as he mentioned in his presentation, investment decisions made in China have global ramifications, and the IEA remains committed to tracking international energy finance flows and deepening our collaboration with partners in China to help strengthen our analysis and improve our energy investment uh, data coverage. Achieving our global and um, clean energy investment goals will require a much faster scale of investment and access to affordable finance for emerging and developing economies. China's impressive experience and leadership 
in clean energy investments provides important lessons for other countries. At the same time, the global transition provides an opportunity for investors in China to finance clean energy projects and provide much needed capital to regions that lack access to affordable finance, including, um, as we've discussed today, Africa. A big thank you to our co-host, the Institute of Energy at Peking University and Energy Foundation China for another successful event. Finally, thank you uh, for to all of you for your attention and active participation. We look forward to discussing these and other pressing energy issues with you in the near future, hopefully in person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia. So now I would like to invite Xin Jianan for a closing remark. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be invited here today. It's a very interesting panel. I'd like to thank all the colleagues from the IEA for your insights and presentation of this report. I'd like to thank the IEA and the Institute of Energy of Beijing University and for co-hosting this report launch. We all know that facing the current challenges of economic recovery, climate change, and all the uncertainties. Where the money is, where the heart is. So, in the we can understand the trends for the multilateral uh, cooperation and also ground for decision making. We can also accelerate the renewable energy objectives. It will be very contribute a good contribution to boost the future development. I think this uh, publication is very important. Moreover, in China, just uh, like uh, in July, IEA's DG came to China and we organized a dinner for in his honor. He also said that IEA very much stresses the development of uh, developing countries and uh, new economies. So in the future, we suppose that the green industry has a very big potential to welcome investment. We just had an estimate, estimate about nine trillion per year, nine trillion dollars of investment per year. So this is a, a huge potential of investment. So how to take advantage of the current growth to adjust the midterm and long-term transition and have a very good connection to meet the challenges, including climate change, and uh, have a very prosperous green transition. So today, this uh, launch is a very good opportunity to have experts together to exchange views and to know what they think about uh, the energy transition. So some of the experts mentioned the trends in recent years. Most investment are coming from developed countries and China and uh, investment in uh, emerging economies in developing countries are relatively uh, uh, smaller. So we see that there are programs and capacity building to help developing countries to also benefit from this green transition. Energy Foundation is working with the IEA. We started a few years ago um, also in April, we published the power market 
report together. So this event, this is also a result of our collaboration. We're also working for a long time with the Institute of Energy. Also, uh, the dinner party hosting executive director of the viral was also co-hosted by uh, uh, Institute of Energy and us. We know that collaboration, international collaboration is very important. And our event today illustrates this important point. Energy Foundation China is willing to continue working with all of you to contribute to the energy transition in China and to support the transition over the world. So we have uh, another work with IEA. Um, Ms. Emma Gordon worked with our Chinese team. This report will probably be published um, in the near future. We look forward to share our experiences with developing countries. We would like to, I would like to appreciate, uh, extend my gratitude again to all the panelists and everyone today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the foundation. And today we went beyond the scheduled time. So I'd like once again to thank our friends online and the present. Many are taking pictures, but to be reassured that uh, photos of this event will be published online and you can also scan this QR code to have all the related information. There's a coffee break outside, a tea break and coffee break with uh, food. So you are invited and we have photographer to take pictures, professional photographer. So now the event is over. Thank you very much.